All right, so our next and final speaker uh, is Sophie Clayton, um, coming from UW, and she's going to be talking about... Is this a good stalling technique? <laughs> <laughs> um, Submesoscale uh, sub modulation of phytoplankton community structure and diversity. Thank you, thank you, um, Dennis and Andrea, for inviting me. This is super exciting. So my last talk here wasn't 27 years ago, but it was 11 years ago. I was a summer student fellow at Hui, um, and I was working on much the same problems that I'm still working on now. So I don't know if that shows a lack of imagination on my part or just a lack of progress, but um, I find physical biological interactions very interesting. So I'm going to talk about some uh, recent work looking at actually observations of phytoplankton community structure rather than models for the most part. Um, and I've been working on trying to observe phytoplankton community, community structure at the sub scale. And when I say sub scale, I'm really talking about a length scale. So I mean order 1 to 10 kilometers, and I'll probably stray into the mesoscale because it can't be helped. So I'm, I'm really interested in things that happen in the scale between 1 and 100 kilometers. Um, so all of my previous, all the previous speakers have done a great job of, of lining everything up for me, essentially. They've hopefully convinced you that we should care about these scales for various reasons. They matter for um, vertical exchange. Um, we see that there's some organization of biomass on these scales. Um, but I'm probably going to, I'm hoping to take it a little bit further. So before I get going, I want to acknowledge um, co-authors of this work. So François Riballet, Jared Sorwell, Marina Levy, and um, Ginger Armbrust, all at, well, mostly at the UW, Marina's in Paris. Um, and I've received funding from the East Science Institute at the UW, Washington Research Foundation, and the Moore Foundation. So again, um, I think that all the previous speakers have hopefully convinced you that we've got plenty of observations um, from satellite and some localized process studies that show that there is structuring of phytoplankton biomass and also other biogeochemical traces on the sub scale. Um, but one of the things that I don't think anyone's touched on much yet is community structures. How, how is biomass partitioned between different constituents of the community on these scales? Does everything look the same? Or do we see any direct structuring of the taxa that we see in any given place that relates to the physical environment? Um, and why we should care about the community structure is really um, actually quite, been quite well studied, so we have different um, functional diversity and taxonomic diversity, so we might have uh, a size structure in the ecosystem that could affect carbon export, so do we see more larger cells at fronts, or do we not see any difference? So that could have an impact on um, carbon export, on uh, rates of production, um, and also if we bring more different phenotypes together in one place, we could be enhancing the stability of the ecosystem in that, in that given environment. If you have more things occupying the same function, if any of them get knocked out, then you can keep that function within that region. So those are some of the motivating factors for me in looking at this work. Um, so this is, this is a modeling slide. I said I wasn't going to show any modeling work, but I am. Um, so this is some previous work of mine from when I was a grad student that I did with Mick Follows. And I worked with the Darwin model, which is a diverse global ecosystem model. And my question was, if I go from a coarse resolution, one degree model, so roughly 100 kilometer resolution, and I bring it down to include mesoscale dynamics, so down to one sixth of a degree, which I guess was about 18 kilometers resolution, what's that going to do to the diversity of the ecosystem in the model? And what this plot shows is annual average richness, so the number of modeled phenotypes within the model, or within the, the globe. And this is the one degree output. And then this is the one sixth of a degree eddy permitting output. So I think it's quite striking already that by including mesoscale dynamics, in the model world at least, locally we can greatly enhance the number of phenotypes that coexist in any given place. Um, and by looking a little bit deeper into the model, because one advantage of model world is you can, actually, you can actually quantify all of the different processes that are going on, right? which is kind of nice. It's hard to do with observations. Um, I could show that this was due partly to mixing, so more things being stirred together. But it was also because we were creating more niches, and more of the phenotypes in the model were 
happy. So they had a positive net growth rate. So there were more things that were thriving in different places, and they were thriving together. And this was just by adding in the mesoscale dynamics at that resolution. So really, we're seeing a combined effect that we infer from stirring things around and bringing things together, but also by creating environments where more things could be happy simultaneously. So moving on from that, so I'm angry with Peter because he already showed Francesco's work, and I want to, do, uh, to bring this in to sort of tie from this global vision of the mesoscale enhancing biodiversity to a regional study where Francesco used um, the FISAT algorithm to get uh, the dominant phenotype from ocean color. And he added in these um, velocity fields, and he could show how different water masses with different dominant types were being stirred together, and that was enhancing the regional biodiversity. So we're not quite at in situ data yet, but this at least is based on some real life fields. And from this, um, I want to talk about some work that I did, again, still in grad school. I hitchhiked onto a boat that was doing a physical oceanography survey of the Kurishio region and did some biology. Um, so we conducted a high resolution survey of the Kurishio extension front, and by high resolution, I mean we took CTD stations roughly nine kilometers apart. And I collected data at each of those stations, so five, five crossings of the front. And what I'm showing you here, the contours here are salinity. And from these surface samples, in collaboration with Alex Warden at Imbari, I looked at uh, two different ecotypes of a phytoplankton called Ostreococcus. And Ostreococcus is known to have two different ecotypes. One is predominantly coastal, and one is oceanic. And up until this point, they'd very rarely been seen to coexist in any field samples. So we looked at this data from the Kurishio, and these show you the surface abundance of these two ecotypes. So the coastal ecotype here, the oceanic, and this is a log scale of the abundance. And you can see that in roughly 50% of the samples from this region that seems that basically coincide with this low salinity water mass that's being advected along the mainstream of the Kurishi extension. These two ecotypes are co-occurring, but not only are they co-occurring, they're also present at very high abundances. So the abundances that we saw in this data set for both of the ecotypes were as high as previous observations, if not higher. So again, from this data, only from this one system for this one week in October 2009, um, we see these two different ecotypes, which we assume are from different ecosystems in some sense, being mingled together, but they also seem to be responding to some forcing at the front that's producing large, um, large numbers of both of them. So they both have a high abundance here. So this is, I thought was great, really interesting work to do. Um, but one of the problems, this kind of work, is first of all, it's kind of hard to do. So taking high resolution surveys that not only give you sort of high spatial resolution, but also some taxonomic resolution is a challenge a fun one, but you know, if you don't have endless funds for sequencing or endless hours of people looking under microscopes, taking lots and lots and lots of samples to try and work out what the community is in those samples is kind of problematic. The other issue is that um, you know, although these process studies are great, they represent one system at one point in time. And one of the questions that I was interested in really was, well, you know, if we looked at lots of these systems, what's the overall effect? So do we see any consistent effect on community structure in frontal systems or mesoscale, sub-mesoscale systems? So I needed to find a source, a large source, of taxonomically resolved data on the phytoplankton community structure that also had been collected at high spatial resolution, which is kind of seemed, seemed impossible. Um, but it wasn't, thankfully for me. So I got a postdoc. <laughs> um, so 
onto the meat of my talk. I'm going to talk about one particular project um, which is working with the Seaflow Underway Flow Cytometer that was developed by Jared Swalwell at the UW. Um, so this is work I've been doing with Ginger Armbrust. Uh, I'm going to show you, talk to you a little bit about the cytometer itself, how it works, or well, not really much how it works, what it does in essence. Um, I'm going to show you the community structure at a couple of fronts from a larger data set. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about trying to take a huge amount of the data that I had, or that I have, and trying to infer what the overall impact or the overall function of these fronts is for the community structure. So Seaflow. Um, here is Seaflow on a good day. This was taken uh, on a cruise in the California Current a few years ago. Um, so Seaflow is a flow cytometer. So it, it's pulling water from the ship's flow through system and it's turning it into a very thin stream. And I'm sorry for all the people who work with flow cytometers. I'm going to butcher this explanation, but I'm guessing that not everybody knows how they work, so bear with me. Um, so we take a thin stream of the water from the ship's flow-through system, shoot a laser at it, and what you see here is a scatter plot of the properties of some of the cells that we see in that flow. So in this case, or in larger case here, we have the forward scatter, which is somewhat analogous to cell size. And then this is fluorescence, a chlorophyll fluorescence in this case, on the y-axis. And we can use these properties to discriminate these cells into different groupings. So you can see quite clearly, this is an example of the output that we get from the flow. There are definite clusters of cells that look similar. And as well as looking at um, Fluorescent, chlorophyll fluorescence, we can look at uh, orange fluorescence to get at different pigments. We're roughly seeing a 0.5 to 5 micron size range. So this is really only seeing the smaller phytoplankton cells in the system. Um, we can look at side scatter too. And then we can use all of that data to assign these blobs to different populations. One of the caveats is that this data is only from the surface. So we've all seen beautiful plots of vertical structure, submesoscale vertical structure. Unfortunately, this instrument cannot resolve any of those beautiful vertical features. But we're collecting samples roughly every three minutes, so we're getting a spatial resolution of somewhere between one and two kilometers. So given that or nothing, I can live with not seeing what the vertical looks like for now anyway. So as I said, we can assign populations. So for the purposes of this work, I've done a very sort of broad brush assignment to all of the data. We've got Prochlorococcus, Synecococcus, and then pretty much everything else sits in the Pico eukaryotes group, which I'm sure is a crime, but again, that'll do for now. And we don't just have one cruise's worth of data. I was lucky enough to turn up when they'd already collected something like 12 cruises worth. So we have chlorophyll on this map here, just to give you a sense of the different environments that we have collected data from. So we've got Trans-Pacific, and then we've got data going down to Aloha, um, and some of this data in the South Atlantic off the coast of South America. So this, was, this seemed like a golden opportunity to take a lot of this high-resolution, taxonomically resolved data and to try and get a sense of what, what might France be doing. Because not only do we have this biological data, we've also got all the data from the ship's TSG. So we have temperature, salinity, I can get at density. Um, fluorescence, not so much, can be a little bit dodgy, so I don't really trust that. Um, but at the minimum, we have this TSG data as well. And I have roughly... 80,000 kilometers worth of underway data to play with. So, before I go into sort of talking about how everything pulled together, um, I wanted to just pull out a couple of examples of what things look like, what the data that we get looks like. So, as I said, we've got the TSG, so I've looked at... Um, the temperature data as well as the biology of the cell counts. And one of the first things I did was to try and identify fronts. So when I'm talking about fronts, all I mean is a temperature gradient above some critical threshold. 
And in this case, I picked a threshold of half a degree over 10 kilometers, because that seemed like a pretty big temperature change particularly in the open ocean. And I should also say I've excluded coastal data from this because although it's super interesting, it kind of confounded all of the patterns that I was trying to look for. Um, so I can take all of this temperature data and find what I call frontal points by looking for regions where DTDX is above some critical threshold. So I can do this for all of the data and I'm just going to pick out three, three points along these tracks to show you what, what these three groups of phytoplankton might be doing at these fronts. So the first one is from the Kurishio region over here. It has to think about it. Okay. So first of all, I want to draw your attention to this axis down here. This is 20 kilometers total, right? So maybe we're looking at 30, a 30 kilometer stretch of data here. We've got temperature, so we're seeing a big drop in temperature of roughly one degree over about, what, five, five kilometers? And then in this plot, I'm showing you the abundance of these three different, I guess I should say, functional groups that we're looking at. Um, Sinecococcus in red, Prochlorococcus in green and the Pico eukaryotes in blue. And the units are 10 to the 6 cells per liter. So the numbers might look a little bit funny. We don't just have 80 cells per mil. That would be kind of crazy. Um, but this is, you know, this is what we might expect to see. So Prochlorococcus, the abundance decreases as temperature decreases. Conversely, Sinecococcus comes up although it is dominant. If you look at those scales, they're not quite the same. And then the pico eukaryotes are following roughly the same pattern as Sinecococcus. So I think I've shown this to several people who've said, yeah, that looks, that's what I'd expect. That's, that's what things should, should, should look like. Um, so now I'm going to show you another piece of data. Now this is from off the coast of South America down here. So the temperature gradient is a little bit less abrupt in this case, but we're still seeing almost a two degree change over around 20 kilometers. And now the, the biological system is a little bit different. We've got Prochlorococcus and Sinecococcus are actually both varying in much the same way across this front. They both see a decrease in their abundance actually as temperature increases. And the pico eukaryotes are doing something a little bit more interesting. Um, so we're seeing an increase in abundance of the pico eukes over around, this is, I guess, seven kilometers. There's a 50% increase in the number of pico eukes just in that region, and then it drops back down again. So I think already some of you could imagine that with traditional CTD stations, we might be missing a lot of this structure if we're only taking a measurement every 10, 20, 50 kilometers. So this, is, this underway sort of data collection method is picking up all sorts of fine scale structure that we wouldn't be seeing otherwise. I'm just going to show you one last example. So this one is from um, north of Hawaii over here. And this is a little bit less pretty. Um, but again, we see a big change in temperature, very localized, so over, over five kilometers. Um, Sinecococcus does not very much. Prochlorococcus, again, does more or less what we would expect. It increases with temperature. And then the pico eukaryotes, depending on whether or not you believe some of these data points, might also be doing something a little bit interesting. But it's not entirely clear. Um, so we have this data. But if I sort of superimpose all of these fronts, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at it, obviously, you can't really tell what's going on. There's no consistent pattern. So I wanted to try and find a way of distilling all of these pieces of frontal data into some, something consistent. So going back to this idea of picking out the fronts, 
I took all of the data and I, I literally split it. So any point that was in a front, I put in the front box, and all the other points go into the background box. And I looked at um, the distribution of the data. So this is, this is for the pico eukaryotes. So this is the relative frequency. So this is basically a histogram. And in black, I'm showing the background. And then in red, what the distribution looks like for the fronts. So you could argue that there's a slight increase in pico eukaryotes in the frontal data, very slight compared to the background, but it's not really clear. So I've done the same again, the Seneca coccus, again, it's not super clear. And prochlorococcus, again, I'd argue that it's, it's not very clear. If I'm just looking at the abundances of these different groups in the fronts or in the background, I'm not convinced that I can see any difference, to be honest. Um, but it occurred to me, I'm looking at data over huge environmental gradients, and these fronts are superimposed on these huge environmental gradients, so it might be a little bit more useful to look at something that more explicitly explores the community structure and the relative abundance of these different things. So some metric that actually looks at how they're arranged with respect to each other. So I used the cell count data to get at the Shannon index, which is a measure of biodiversity. And the Shannon index is based on the relative abundance of each of the phytoplankton types. Um, and it reflects not only the richness of the number of species present, but also the evenness of the community. So depending on how, um, basically, the more evenly distributed the community, the higher your Shannon index. So here we go, just to sort of give you a sense. This is an example where we have two different um, cells, and this red line shows what the Shannon index would be. In this range where the abundance of the two is very similar, we're maximizing the value of the Shannon index. So just to give you a sense of how this works. So taking all of the data, I'm not going to show you that, taking all of the data, I calculated the Shannon index for all of these points um, and split it again. So in red, this is the Shannon index for all of the points that were in front. And in black, the Shannon index for all of the points that fell out into the background. And I think um, this is a little bit more convincing than looking at the abundances of the different functional groups. And what we're seeing in, in the background, we tend to see systems dominated by one particular group. When you get into the fronts, you're shifting much more towards these higher numbers. And we have these two peaks really reflecting um, the subtropical regions and then the subpolar regions in the data. So even in the subtropics where prochlorococcus is typically very dominant, we're still seeing a shift to a more even community in these frontal points, which is right there. And then this is where we have um, a little bit more diversity in the background in the subpolar regions. Uh, how am I doing time? Oh, good. So, um, yes, basically what I just said. So the fronts seem to be producing or driving more even um, populations. So we're moving up this Shannon line here. So promoting evenness. And that's pretty much where I want to end. Um, so I think the big conclusion of my talk anyway is that sub scales or what we, I think I probably phrased this wrong. I don't mean to say sub scales support higher diversity. What I'm saying is when we look at physical features on that scale, we're seeing a biological response. So we're seeing a more even community. It could be down to just stirring of populations, but it could also be down to um, some response to a nutrient impulse or to um, some change of the mixed layer that's mediating the light environment. That we can't really tell from the data that we have. Um, high resolution taxonomically resolved data is still difficult to get a hold of. Um, I've shown you a bunch of data that I was very lucky to get my hands on, but it's all from the surface. 
And I'm sure that if we were to include some vertical structure in this, we'd see much more of the story and probably be able to get a better sense of this question of stirring versus response. Um, God knows, even if we could include some kind of zooplankton data, that would be amazing, because we could start to ask questions of whether we see any difference in grazing in these features versus outside. Um, and then my sort of current obsession, biomass is really cool to look at, and it's relatively easy to measure, but it's not really telling us what's happening. What about rates? So do we know that there's a difference in any of the biological rates in these systems? How do we track that? What about the function of the community? So we can look at the constituents, we can ask who's there, but what are they actually doing? And does that change when we go into these environments? Um, and that's where I'm gonna end. I thought these might be some interesting questions to spark off the discussion. Hey, Sophie, um, that was a nice talk. I was just, it seems to me that um, density gradients might have a more sort of dynamical implication mm -hmm. in terms of the, what's going on at that, at that front and temperature maybe has some connection to the biology or some control on biology, um, but there can be compensated fronts in temperature uh, that aren't um, dynamically so important. I've done the uh, same analysis using density fronts, and actually one of the next things I'm planning to do is to split these into compensated versus uncompensated fronts to see if I can get a better sense of, of how things fall out. Because I would imagine that at compensated fronts, you're probably not getting much of a dynamical response. Yeah, but they could be indicative of but, the stirring yes, question. exactly. So. Yeah, cool. so it could be a nice way of counterpointing the two. Hey, Sophie, that's really interesting. And, and something that strikes me on your last figure here is this bimodal distribution of the Shannon Index mm -hmm. uh, along the fronts. And I'm wondering if it might make sense to, to follow up on, on uh, what Melissa just said. So if you were to look at density fronts that you know, were, were robust, maybe reorient the data so you're always going in the same direction of the density yeah. gradient, right? Because there might actually be an orientation of the diversity, be it over lighter, heavier water. So it seems like that, I mean, maybe that would collapse that bimodal distribution. Um, no, that's very a good cool idea. Yeah. Alexander Bordansky, uh, old, sorry, <laughs> old Dominion. Hello. Uh, it, it looks like, I mean, of course, you measured for the picker eukaryotes, you measured organisms that are autotrophic, but there are a lot of mixotrophic uh, organisms as well. Mm -hmm. And that means they take up some of the pico you care, uh, that, uh, the pico plankton. So uh, you saw some really inverse relationships there at some point of time between the pico eukaryotes and the pico, I mean the, the prokaryotes. Yeah. So there might be a, a grazing effect that gets me back to uh, Debbie's point originally with the top-down control that might play a role here as well over larger scales. I can I add, let me add a point to that. So I would love. If you, if you I, go back I, to that I want slide. to find lots of ways of observing biology or uh, community structure in a sort of simple way, right? So without having to stop and take, pick up water. So optical <laughs> methods and these sort of cytometric methods. But if anybody has any cool tips on stuff I might do with this data or other, other proxies I could use, like please come and talk to me because you know, this is, it's, it's very difficult to get any high res data that we can really line up with the physics. So I'm, you know, I'm open to all suggestions for data sets or types of data that could be used other than this, or as well as this. Uh, nice talk, Sophie. Uh, you showed a, f a few scatter uh, plots there of your flow cytometer data. Oh, yeah. Have, have you been able to see any variation in that PICO community? Because, of course, that's an enormously taxonomically diverse bin that you're using. And I'm wondering if you're able to see any patterns with that enormous data set that you have. I honestly haven't looked yet. Um, one of, or actually no, let me rephrase that. I looked three years ago. Um, one of the issues with the data set, as wonderful as it is, it has been collected over several years. 
several different cruises, different iterations of the instrument. Um, and we normalize to beads. So we always run beads the same size as the instrument. But we're not always looking at exactly the same window. So for the most part, it doesn't make a huge difference. I've checked. But it does make it a little bit more complicated to sort of go into any great detail in that Pico Uke box. But I do think it's worth going back to and looking at it again. And it might actually work better on some of the newer, new generation Cflow data that I haven't included in this yet. Or, or to go in in a targeted way with yeah. you know, some of the hypotheses you've generated and yeah. see what you Yeah, get definitely. Out. Sophie, I was noticing in your um, scatter plots from the instrument, there are a lot of particles down there that had no fluorescence but still had a size, and so those might be some of the eukaryotic um, protists. And I wonder if you could use those to estimate microzooplankton biomass or size diversity or something like that. Maybe if someone knows how, <laughs> if someone knows how to get like what uh, what variables to look at in cytom cytometer space, I would yeah, I'd love to, but. Not entirely sure how to do that yet. Take it. Uh, I guess. Yeah, I think so.